to the August 19th, 2020 um, meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors. Um, let's take attendance. Uh, Anaket? Here. Jill? Here. Andrew? Here. Emma? Here. Mara? Here. Uh, Jerry? Here. Ryan? Here. And Bridget? Here. Uh, did I miss anyone? No, oh, great. Um, first, I want to add one quick thing uh, to the agenda before we go to public comment. Um, a couple of people have asked for a discussion about the possibility of meeting in person. So I just want to add that to, um, we can do that after the consent agenda um, and before board discussion. Um, with that, uh, public comment, I, looks like we have some members of the public, um, if anyone wants to speak, um, could you use the hand raise function in Zoom? And if that doesn't work for you, just wave your hand in front of the screen until I notice you. Hand wave function. Or you can just speak out loud if you see neither. And um, yeah, if you go to participants, um, there's a little uh, button that says raise hand. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So it looks like uh, Julia and Rhett. So uh, Julia, since you were quicker with the hand raise function, you get to go first. Thank you. So I actually have, um, there, both of us want to say each say something, and I actually have two statements to read, neither of which are my own. Okay. So, um, Maybe I'll go and then you can go and yeah. then I can go. Okay. Yeah. So um, my name is Julia Shavitz. I'm a parent of a rising first grader. Um, the first statement I'll read is from Andy Dorwart Crane. My name is Andy Dorwart Crane, and I'm a white mother of a white child at UES and a healthcare provider to mostly white patients. I grow increasingly concerned about how our educational and healthcare institutions address systemic racism, especially in light of continued tragic historical events, such as the murder of George Floyd. This is a topic that is vast, complex, uncomfortable, and will not go away anytime soon. When one encounters a problem such as this, it is impossible to come up with a single resolution, uh, sorry, a single solution. So instead we chip away at it. We uncover routines, traditions, old ideas, and we change them for the good of everyone in our communities. I support removing the school resource officer from our school district. I submit my statement tonight with more questions for this board and the superintendent than answers. I have become aware that the SRO position holds no job description. Its history is vague and it demands school and city monetary resources. We do know from multiple sources, advocacy institutions, and BIPOC student testimonies that a police officer's presence is traumatic to students of color. We know that training of police officers lacks in addressing systemic racism or their part in it. We know that there is a racial divide when it comes to associating a police officer with a culture of safety. We also know that we do not have enough resources to meet the social and mental wellness of students. Students in this district are denied opportunities to have their very own behavioral needs met due to a lack of appropriately trained staff. I know this happened to a friend of mine's son last year, and now his parents are considering whether they can keep him in the MRPS district if there is no one available to meet his needs. So my question to you is, why maintain an SRO position in our school that has no identified job description, roles, or duties, and the presence of said person subjects students of color to trauma? Why maintain a position without known evidence of benefit and that contradicts the foundations of F22 policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why sacrifice part of our budget to this position when we could be using that money towards an evidence-based intervention to enrich the social and mental well-being of all students? If our goal is safety and well-being of our entire student community, why wouldn't we use these very funds toward a position that benefits all, harms none, and continues to move our district towards dismantling systemic racism? 
I look forward to hearing your answers to these questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Julia. You want to read another? Or? Oh, you go. Ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, my name is Will Roberts, and uh, thanks a lot for hearing my statement tonight. I speak to you as a white parent of a white child that's in this district, and I also live and work in Montpelier. I'd like to add my voice in support of the national call led by black and brown people throughout Vermont to remove the school resource officer from all of our schools. As a white parent of a white, of a white child, I'm only moderately aware of the perspective of many folks of color in, on this issue, uh, including the issue of the SRO. But I've come to see my spotty but growing level of awareness of racial, racial injustice as an outgrowth of my white privilege. What I have learned in listening to racially diverse perspective is that any police presence in schools is potentially harmful to the learning experience of students of color. We know that racial inequity has long occurred in the U.S. and that it's been maintained by systemic racism and violence, often legally san sanctioned. That violence is still very present today, as evidenced by the most recent round of police killings of people of color this spring and summer. Let's not have symbols of that violence, however well-meaning in our schools, we know too that while intention is important and that individuals can be well-meaning, this thinking about intention and individ individuality is a fruit of privilege. The impact on the school population is what truly matters, and systems of oppression are not rendered in are not rendered equitable because of well-intentioned individuals. People of color have been and continue to be disproportionately mistreated by law enforcement. Between individual implicit bias and systemic racism, people of color suffer much more greatly in interactions with law enforcement than do white people. This trend applies to young people and adults alike. If we want to work to if we want to work toward greater racial equity in our schools, I believe it is wise to listen to the Black Lives Matter suggestion and remove the SROs from the schools. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and Rhett, do you still want to go? I see your um, hand has gone away, but i um, happy to hear from you if, you if you still want to speak. I do, thank you. Um, late breaking news from Roxbury is our Dottie Griefree is going to be retiring and I wasn't aware but there were only I think five or so preschoolers signed up and so I'm just curious about what preschool in Roxbury might look like um, if there is preschool at all um, whether the uh, Jenny Allen's kangaroo care Kangaroo Kids Care program, which is runs from 11 to almost five, providing a full day of childcare, <clears throat> the two of them together. Um, whether that there's a possibility that that whether there is a possibility that that could continue to exist. My questions are <clears throat> a little bit more pragmatic than Julia and, um, which I am interested in the answers to their questions as well, but. Um, just, you know, not knowing what's going on with pre-K in Roxbury and the, you know, significant changes in the last hour, um, just looking for some sort of guidelines so that I could make plans moving forward for me and my family, um, but not to diminish anyone else's questions in any way. Yeah, thanks everyone uh, for speaking and thanks Rhett. If you look at the agenda as soon as we get past the consent agenda and a quick discussion about meeting in person, um, the RVS pre-K is on on the agenda. So if you stick with us a little while, hopefully um, Olivia will will, uh, will give you information that should answer most of your questions and if, if, she, if she doesn't, uh, feel free to, to email her and, I'm, and she'll be happy to um, answer any further questions you have. I do want to say on the SRO, I, I just want to again reiterate we are taking this up in September. Um, and I also, let me correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that we already have a move. The SRO would not be physically located at 
in the district in a district building um, for the start of the school year, um, which which is a change. Uh, I know it doesn't address all your concerns, but it certainly removes um, a permanent SRO presence. Uh, and then we will discuss further that that um, that that is by no means the end of the conversation on this. But I just wanted to let people know that um, you know, as of the school year, the SRO will not be uh, physically housed in the building, which is which is a departure from from past years. Um, uh, on to uh, right. Jim, hold on a second. Julia, did you have another statement you wanted to read? I did, but I can hold it for next time. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, I appreciate the time you all have given, and I know you've got a lot to do. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, 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 I love you. Um, thanks for noticing that, Libby. Uh, on to the consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Jim, Jim, just we had a we put in a resignation in there just last minute. Yeah. And a new hire too, just to make sure everybody has those that they're. Yeah, and Anna sent those around just a bit ago. Um, So any, I move uh, that we approve the consent agenda, including the the um, resignation and new hires distributed after the original meeting materials were distributed. Great, thanks, Bridget. Do I have a second? In that motion. Thanks, Mara. Uh, any discussion? Great. Um, under the vote, Annika. Aye. Jill. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Emma. Aye. Mara? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Great. Um, consent agenda passes. Uh, we uh, had some discussion, I think this is going to be pretty quick, about um, meeting in person. Uh, that uh, it was a suggestion that Emma brought up and um, uh, a, a couple people weighed in on by email. Uh, as you know, we've been meeting virtually since March, uh, since COVID, uh, with one exception. Uh, we had a, a longer uh, kind of planning meeting that we met in person, socially distancing. Uh, in, at the library, um, which I think worked relatively well. Uh, I'll let um, Emma speak, but I'll just kind of lay out the, the pros and cons as, as I see them quickly. Uh, in terms of pros, I think it's, it's I actually liked it. I, it's, it's good to, to meet in person. I like seeing folks. Um, uh, you know, as, as Emma stated, uh, it shows some solidarity with others who have to, to return to the, the building um, for educational purposes to, to teach our kids uh, and to keep the buildings clean and safe. Um, on the, the con side, uh, I think there's, there's a couple major ones. Um, one is uh, kind of on, on the non-safety side, which is the that, uh, well, it's, it's safety and non-safety combined, but uh, with the building restrictions, uh, public comment would have to occur virtually. Uh, it's a little more awkward uh, when we're all together and the public is on Zoom. Um, and I think some people have, have liked the, the public format. And to, to be honest with you, we've, we've gotten higher participation on Zoom than we usually do in person, which I think has to do with some of the pressing issues uh, before us. But I also think quite honestly, it has to do with the convenience of, of just being able to dial up Zoom and you know still keep an eye on your kiddos or uh, you know not have to, to get in your car and, and, and physically go somewhere and, and sit for a while. Um, so I, I think we could figure that out, but it's, it's a challenge. Um, the other is, is a safety consideration, uh, which kind of plays in my mind, although why I would prefer in person, um, I feel that our, our task overall is, is risk mitigation. 
Um, and I think that if we keep numbers low in Vermont, we can have successful school openings. And I think part of keeping numbers low in Vermont uh, involves restricting any unnecessary uh, contact between people. Um, and I think we're kind of at a point where, you know, the, probably the smartest health thing to do is to have every meeting virtually that we can have virtually. Um, and I think this is a meeting that we can have virtually and su successfully have been having virtually. Um, that said, there is a lot of, of uh, you know, symbolic and, and other uh, reasons to, to, to hold it in person and, and to show solidarity, I think, to get a sense of, uh, of what it's like to participate in a group with, with masks and social distancing, which is what our, our educators are gonna have to do um, day in and day out. Um, and the other con is it, it creates some extra work for our cleaning crews. Uh, it's, it's another meeting in the school. Uh, it's another reason they have to come in and, and, and make sure things are clean. Um, so, so I'll let, let others speak on it. I know Emma, you, you proposed it. So maybe you want to speak, but I'm happy to hear from everyone. And, and then, um, it'd be great to get kind of consensus going forward about how we do it. I think if we did do it in person, um, I, I would strongly favor giving any board member uh, who has uh, any concerns about meeting in person the option to, to participate virtually if, if that uh, feels safer to, to him or her. Um, sure, I mean, I think you summarized pretty well uh, any discussion that I heard around it. Um, my my basic gut feeling is that if we're if we as a board are standing behind our superintendent and the decision that we're making as a district um, for students and educators to go back in person, that we should follow suit with those guidelines and do six feet apart, you know, social distance, masks on, meetings as well. So that's where my gut lies. I think it's the right thing to do. Others? Yeah, I, oh, Bridget. Um, I, you know, it, I think it's a really hard decision, Jim, and I, I think you summed up well the pros and cons. Um, and I do very much want the board to show support for teachers. Um, but I, I just, I, I, to me, the public participation part just cuts very heavily in favor of keeping, keeping them remote because I, the idea of us having to hold a meeting in person, six feet apart and masked means, and while the public is on Zoom, is gonna make us interacting with the public and the public being able to hear us through that connection. I, I just think we're gonna lose this, what we have now, which is a really robust platform for the public to participate, to comment on and be in these meetings. And it's so hard to mix virtual participation with a socially, a properly safe, socially distanced in-person setting. Um, so, you know, the nine of us will be able to have our meetings, but I feel like we're gonna lose this ability to, for the public. Um, so that's one concern. And, and my other concern is that I feel like as we're opening, um, not only are we gonna, you know, are the public gonna wanna be able to see these board meetings and, and provide comment as they're experiencing the school's opening, um, but we're probably going to want to be hearing from our administrators um, and they're already really stretched to the limit um, and having having hearing from them, meaning that they have to also um, come in person to yet another evening meeting that um, is going to keep them late. I also am concerned about that after they've been in the building all day. So I just I, I feel like those practical concerns weigh in favor of staying staying remote for the next for at least for the next couple months. Thanks for giving us the chance to talk about it. Yeah. Um, Jim, Jim, I'd like to add to that too, um, because I sent you and Libby an email and Emma an email on this. Um, and instinct, I read that and I, I had a gut reaction, which was, yes, you know, if we're, if, if we're putting our, if our teachers and our students and other staff are going back into the building, even with all the precautions in place, we should be willing to do that too. We should be standing on the same ground as um, the rest of our schools. We shouldn't be holding ourselves to a different standard. 
Um, but as I've considered it more, I've talked with a number of administrators and teachers about this, and nobody really seems to be on exactly the same page. And I think it would be helpful to hear from Libby because one of my biggest concerns is that this will add burden to a district that's already stretched extremely thin. Um, and that is, that is a serious concern of mine. Um, I've heard from some folks, you know, you could potentially be adding risk. And I think if 10 people can't meet in the library 10 feet apart, that raises some significant questions about returning to school in a physical space as much as we all want it. But I've also heard the argument um, and definitely considered the argument of risk versus reward. And um, I don't think that we do gain that much by meeting in person for board meetings, whereas there are a lot of kids who really will gain from, from attending class in person. Um, and as Bridget mentioned, I do see a lot of gain from meeting on Zoom in this environment. The access to public meetings, although it might not be as equitable as we'd like, it's still vastly improved from where it was even before the pandemic. And I think there, there are some lessons to be learned from this moving forward even after this. So I just wanted to share that with everyone because I hadn't really circled back with Libby or Emma. I did speak with Jim. So. Uh, any other thoughts? And um, I'd love to hear from. Um, so Jim, this is Jerry. Uh, the only thing is, when we did try it once, it was it was pretty horrible to to make it work with virtual and physical. Yep. So we would definitely have to um, come up with some kind of technology plan or something. And I was thinking about this too, and then it, it's like, well, that's one more thing that, you know, people who are already stretched have to focus on. But um, it, it definitely didn't work very well when it was a hybrid model. Yeah, other thoughts? I mean, that's, that's kind of where I think I'm leaning to, I, I think, with the the difficulty of hybrid. I, I think if we had an easy hybrid solution that worked and uh, wouldn't take up, uh, you know, Libby and, and Mike's time to, to figure out some sort of technological solution um, easily, uh, it would be nice to have, you know, an in-person option with a with a robust virtual option. I think absent that. Uh, it's probably better to stay online, but if, if others feel strongly, I'm, I'm definitely happy to, to go in a different direction. But I think my recommendation would be to keep this format, um, you know, maybe check in in a few weeks as we see how school goes. Um, and also maybe, um, maybe when, when things calm down a little uh, and we get into a routine, we can think a little more about a virtual solution. But um, if people feel strongly about in person, uh, I'm certainly open to that as well. Just take a little, let's take a little informal poll. Um, just so I, I, I know. Uh, Anakit, are, are you uh, okay um, keeping this format for a while or do you want to try to move to in person? Um, no, I'm okay keeping this format. I just wanted to uh, voice my um, the same feelings. I, you know, I, I basically thought of the same thing. Like, hey, that's a that's a great idea. We should do it. And as I'm thinking and I'm listening to you guys talk about the different uh, challenges in that and the advantages and especially the ROI, uh, what are we getting in return um, by doing this and what are we losing? Uh, that to me, I, I kind of started leaning towards yeah keeping the, the um, virtual option uh, or, or sticking with that makes more sense. Um, one thing I do, I'm sorry, I'm taking that. Um, you wanted to take a, 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 a informal survey and I started talking. Okay. Uh, but, um, is there any benefit of, I know, let me ask this, is there a benefit of doing this, um, introducing this and then more online, but maybe uh, once in you know, once in two months or whatever, something like that as a, as a in-person option. I know the 
setup would basically um, take as much time anyways. If you're setting it once, you know, you can use it for cleaning and all that stuff or, or setting up the, uh, uh, hybrid, the hybrid option. But um, just, you know, if you, if you want to show solidarity with the teachers, um, is that something that, that we could try? I think we, we could definitely try it, and, and you know, again, maybe we can I, I, again after school starts. Uh, Libby and I can think, yeah, you know, bring Mike and think a little more about um, how to pull in a virtual option. You know, from a practical standpoint, I could see something like some of our early budget meetings, where we're really talking about ideas being a little more productive for us in person. Um, and if we can figure out a way, you know, but that'll be. Um, you know, October, early November, which is which is not very far away at all. Um, but obviously, we want to make sure that that information gets conveyed to the public too. But uh, yeah, that might be a time when we're we're past the start of school. Hopefully, in a bit of a routine uh, where maybe that would be a good meeting to to try to bring us in person and um, and, and see how it goes. Jill. Yeah, I would just say, um, I'm just, um, thank you, Emma, for raising it, and I completely agree with and support that sentiment. I sort of had the same kind of circular logic that I heard Andrew and Anna Kit mention. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable to go whichever way the rest of the board feels is appropriate. I'm happy to go in person. I feel confident that that can be done safely. But I do think, um, frankly, from a convenience and accessibility standpoint, I actually find that um, this has worked really well. I, you know, you can see folks popping in and out of the meetings. You can see staff can pop in and out. The public can participate. There are nights when I've had my daughter here and I would have had to leave her alone to go in person. And I know we've seen lots of kids in the background and, and other reasons why um, I think just from an accessibility and a, and a convenience standpoint that I'm finding this working um, really well. But I'm, I'm happy to go with whatever the majority of the board prefers. Thank you. Andrew? Sorry, I have a, I am curious though, because I'm assuming this, and I think this is the right assumption. Libby, if we were to meet in person, based on some of the, the cleaning protocols we've been told about, um, would this be just an, one more thing that, you know, the district really has to deal with right now at the outset? Because that's, that's one of my biggest concerns. Yes, so I, I spent six hours of my day moving boxes today because we're short custodians. So that's where we are right now. That's our reality. Yeah. I move boxes all day with Andrew DeRosa. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow I will spend the day tearing down boxes and taking out air purifiers and delivering them to classrooms. So yes, that will put our custodian staff out. Yeah. So as somebody who was extremely like fired up by what you wrote, Emma, and I still am fired up about that sentiment, and I am extremely thankful for our public educators and all of our staff and, and our students who are going to try and um, really make this happen. And it really is contingent upon our entire community to make it happen. We all need to be responsible um, because one person could really ruin this for everybody. Um, although I... I, I want to stand there with teachers in person. I don't want to add to the burden of the district right now. Um, and so I, yeah, Jim, I, I, I support this. I, I support your proposal to not begin meeting in person just yet. Good. Thanks, Andrew. Emma? I understand all the logic and I read the school board association recommendation as well and, and their logic behind um, recommending that school boards do not meet in person. And I definitely think there's um, a lot to be said for people being able to participate via Zoom, you know, the public being able to participate via Zoom and also administrators and teachers. Um, so, I mean, all of these arguments make a lot of sense to me. And I, I'm kind of like where Jill is standing and Andrew, where, you know, if the logic outweighs the, the desire to sort of do what in my gut feels right, then I'm fine to go in that direction. And I wouldn't want to do something just for the sake of optics, you know, if it's, if it's working better and it makes more sense, um, then, then I'm fine with that. But I, I'm also convinced that we can do it safely and meet in person. And I think we can work around um, the hybrid, make a hybrid model that works 
to invite the public in using Zoom. So I'd be interested in, in working towards that. And I'm totally fine with, put, with tabling it for now and moving forward on Zoom um, because everybody has so much on their plate right now at the beginning of the school year and we're still sort of ironing out the details and opening up boxes and distributing filters and those types of things. So I definitely am, am happy to put it sort of in the order of priority wherever it belongs. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Amara? Um, I just want to raise up that I personally, this is just Mara personally, um, I'm an extreme extrovert, like all the way out of the box extrovert. And so, um, you know, even Zoom meetings feel a little bit like I can't get my brain completely running. So I was really excited about the idea of in-person meetings because I like because for my learning style and for my talking style and for my thinking style that works great but all of the other like it makes more sense resource wise it makes more sense risk wise not to be in person I mean I'm in favor of doing the thing that makes the most sense and I just wanted to you know just kind of say out loud that like that's one of the reasons that I think we're going back to school is because learning and thinking and being in personal community really does matter. And so I, I wouldn't want it to get lost that somehow the board's like, well, well, yes, the kids and the teachers can go back, but we won't. Where, where I'm thinking that I, I'm actually personally experiencing a little bit of a loss to do it this way, but that the overall will be better if we if we continue distance and continue public access and continue risk production and resource production. Okay, thanks, Mara. Brad? Sure. Well, even though I'm not an extrovert like Mara, more of an introvert, I'm going to echo her same story, essentially. You know, I actually find it a bit sad. I've only sat at the table with the majority of our board. Um, I've never sat at the table with Emma as a board member maybe one or two meetings with Annika and Jill before we had to shut everything down. Um, like me personally, I would much rather be in the building with everybody working on our um, board meetings or board work. But my gut reaction when I first saw the proposal a few days ago was, we're just gonna isolate the public. We're not gonna be able to get the public engagement the way we are right now. And as much as I would like to come together, be in the building, do good work, I just don't see that benefit outweighing, not necessarily we'd be isolating the public, but when's the last time we've had 20 plus people at board meetings? Um, <laughs> very, very rarely. Um, so yes, I think that the opportunity for people to engage, um, to follow, to participate, the way we have things set up right now is our best bet moving forward for a little while. Obviously willing to change um, if the situation changes, but yeah, I would continue with our current approach for a while. Thanks, Ryan. Bridget? I support staying with, with the Zoom for a while. Maybe others have others have addressed it, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks. And Jerry? Yeah, I support staying with Zoom as well. I just don't think we would get... I know for us personally, we're... Uh, really stretched because of what's going on. Our work schedules have changed. Everything has changed. We can't get a, a the same kind of support that we usually would. So even for the public to get a babysitter would be almost impossible, um, that kind of thing. So I would, I would stay with this for a while. Good, thanks, Jerry. So we'll do that. We'll stay on this for a while. Um, you know, Libby and I will uh, kind of think, particularly as we move into budget season, about how we might be able to um, start doing at least some meetings uh, with a hybrid model. But I think for the, the start of the year, until we see how it goes uh, for the resource and public participation concerns, I think it makes sense to, to stick with this, this model. Um, OK. Uh, Sorry for that agenda detour, Libby, um, but I think it was a discussion we, we needed to have. Um, now on to uh, COVID-19 planning, which I'm, I'm sure there's, there's not much going on there. <laughs> well, I've handed it all over to our amazing principals now, since we're in in-service. They're, they're rocking it out now. 
Um, so I've split this up, buildings and, grounds, buildings and grounds update, RBS update, in service, and just reminders of new guidance on safety. Um, so buildings and grounds update, the ventilation work is occurring daily. Actually met our, met our main guy today um, who's doing the ventilation work. Andrew's working really closely with him. Our air purifiers are in, each building has them. I'll spend tomorrow taking them out of boxes um, and they'll get into classrooms just as soon as we can get them into classrooms. Every single classroom will have one and we have extras for other spaces as well. Um, <clears throat> window work is occurring. So every classroom will have at least two open windows that have a screen on them. I know UES has many of the screens because I saw them today. Um, and we have lots of extra ones as well. That, so that work is happening at the moment. So our ventilation should look um, as good as it's gonna look uh, starting the, in the beginning of the year. I'm really pleased with how fast that's going and a big thank you to Andrew LaRosa who just jumped on. He wasn't going to jump on, but he just jumped on. <laughs> I saw the meeting. Um, so he's, he's been doing awesome and he probably hates that I'm put, putting him out there like that, but um, he's just an awesome guy and has really worked his rear off to get this part of the plan in place for kids and, and faculty. Um, RBS, so we have found a one-two teacher. It was in your packet today. Yay! <laughs> Beth has been working very hard on that. Good job, Beth. Um, we have part of a nurse. We have um, a nurse who didn't want the full job, but she's doing part of it. And we're work, are we still working, Beth, on getting the other part filled? You're still in conversations around that, correct? Uh, yes, she's waiting to see what her grandchildren's schedule is, and then hopefully she'll get back to us for the other days. Okay, so fingers crossed that that works out, um, but we will have a nurse at RBS on Monday, Wednesdays, and sometimes Fridays um, so going forward. That should be in your board packet next week or next time. Uh, we still have an open 0.5 FTE in special education, but Bill has been uh, working with Beth to think about how else we could do that piece for case management. Management, I think Mike's being pulled into that too with the virtual academy piece. Um, and so we're working on how we can cover that because we just don't think we're gonna be able to hire that 0.5 special educator at uh, RBS. We don't have any candidates. Um, our pre-K teacher is retiring. Um, we're going to post it, but um, pre-K teachers, licensed pre-K teachers are not easy to find. They're kind of like health teachers, not easy to find in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> you like that, Mara? <laughs> you understand that analogy? <laughs> um, so we are not going to be able to run the pre-K section part of our pre-K at Roxbury until we get a licensed teacher in that classroom. Um, we do have five kids signed up at this moment, Beth? There were five as of today, and I did reach out to families just to let them know that they should be prepared to flex if needed. Yeah, we've been working closely with um, the people, folks over at UES, and Ryan, I don't know if you have those numbers on you, but probably not, but we've been talking to Diana pretty closely about the pre-K numbers at UES to see if there's any openings there. I know they're less than they usually are, but I'm not sure. You Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, we have 20 students enrolled right now. Typically, we have 32 students enrolled in the program. So there are openings at UES? Yeah. So we could, um, people who are interested in that option, we, have, we could fit them into our UES. And so, Beth, when you're reaching out to families, that's definitely an option. I've tried to reach Northfield. They won't call me back. Um, the superintendent's had some illness, so so uh, she's she's not. I don't want to burden her with that. But I've called the principal. I've called the registrar. They have don't have any answers for me over at Northfield in terms of spaces at Northfield. But my hunch would be that if UES has spaces, Northfield probably does as well. Um, and that, of course, we would pay for through the Act 166. UES, we would um, parents would just come and bring them to our UES program. Um, so that is an option for our parents at Roxbury who have pre-K children. We, the dinosaur daycare, so was the, the after school, that's not care. Care. what is it? Kangaroo, kangaroo. Why do I keep, well, I, that's the third time I've done that. The kangaroo care <laughs> at Roxbury in the afternoon is still planning on going. Um, we're still scheduled to go that. They still have kids registered for that. So we have no plans on on turning that down, that usually starts around 11, I believe, in the day. 
Um, so that is set to go. Um, it just doesn't have the pre-K piece before that. So there's not the full day care, but there is care starting at 11. Um, again, we'll post that pre-K position, and if we can find a pre-K teacher, then we'll run a pre-K at Roxbury. It's just we have to find the teacher first. Um, but I'll stop there. Any board questions around that piece? No? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, the Roxbury bus is another concern. Again, we have seven kids who are signed up for that bus. The bus is $57,000 um, for seven kids to ride it. I have spoken with Stacy Emerson around other options for RVS families for busing. There are no other smaller options. They have no Suburbans that are available. Um, they have no smaller buses that are available. They're all being used. Um, and she's she while well, she has a driver for that bus, she's a little concerned about drivers for that bus as well. Um, so the I put it towards the board that I would recommend that we cancel that bus for the year. It doesn't save on the entire fifty seven thousand dollars. It saves on the mileage and the driver, which we did see significant savings in the spring because that's what the bus company um, worked out with us in the spring when we weren't running buses. But we do have a contract with them that we've signed, so. Um, we do have to pay for the bus still, uh, but that would be up for board discussion um, as in regards to what we want to do with that piece. It would be a significant savings for the district. Um, however, these are seven families who are counting on the bus to, to take their kids, and Ryan is, is one of those <laughs> families, so um, I'm sure he has an opinion on that. But I'll let the, the board discuss what we want to do with the RBS bus, if we want to continue running it or not. And when do we need to make a do you need to make a decision on that tonight? Um, well, we want to let the bus company know uh, relatively soon. So our next board meeting is um, That's in September. Is the second of September, which gives um, a little bit of time still. So we could we could discuss it next time. Emma, it looked like you wanted to say something. Um, I guess I just wanted clarification. So you're saying that the, the $57,000, we've already contracted with the bus company for that? We've already contracted for the bus. So what they would do with us is the same thing they did in the spring, which is we don't pay for the driver and we don't pay for the gas, essentially. Is this, can I just wanted some clarity. Is, is this the bus that goes around Roxbury to bring kids to the elementary school, not the bus that goes yeah, we're not talking about the bus from Roxbury to Montpelier. We're talking about the bus that goes around for Roxbury Village School. Okay. Is there a possibility that we could offer parents a financial stipend in lieu of the bus? So that's been suggested, I believe, by Julia. <laughs> that was suggested um, to me. Our auditors do not like that because we can't prove that that is what people spend the money on. Um, so we... we We've been, districts have been slapped in the hand before around that. I can check with Grant around that piece. I just know that it has not been um, smiled upon by our auditors in the past to do that kind of piece, like mileage reimbursement or mileage cards or gas cards or things like that um, have not, not been allowed for other purposes. Should we do something creative like buy gas cards therefore we know where the money went and give those yeah that's what i was just referring to because oh, sorry, all gas answer. cards would be to like a mobile station right <laughs> and so the mobile station has left that that's just i'm just reiterating what auditors have told me in the past for other other pieces jill i was just wondering since it's a, such a small number of parents if um libby you or um Beth have spoken to them at all? Because I'm, I'm really loath to take that away, even if it's just for seven families. I, I, I just feel like if we're not at the point we need to make that kind of a change, I'd hate to do that when we are all grasping for any sort of stability and things we can depend on. I'd hate to, I'd hate to make that change if those families were counting on it. I have not talked to any of the families. I don't know if Beth has. I've had families reach out to me and I've been quite honest saying that we're not quite sure what's going to happen and I did mention to some that it was going to be the trap tonight and I did mention how we have such a low number so I'm not really certain how it was going to shake out that it was a board decision. 
So I do know that it will impact some families. Um, yeah, and I am, I am concerned about the bus driver as well situation. Um, so we do have one lined up right now, like I said, um, but Stacy is not confident that that will last for the entire year either. So it seems like I, I second Jill's, Jill's sentiment and just so folks know, we had a finance committee meeting before this and we're in about as good of condition as you can be in considering the economic climate that we're, we're in and heading into, it seems. Um, so that being said, although it would be nice to have savings there, you know, if families really, really need this, that's, that's something that I, I think should maybe take precedent there. But I think it would be helpful if we talked with, if it's only six, seven families, if we could engage with them and see if we might be able to find some other kind of community solution. Because what I'm hearing from you, Libby, is even if we went with the bus, it's not a guarantee that would be able to have a driver for that bus throughout the entire year. It seems like a pretty uncertain situation. It is an uncertain one, yes, because of the driver situation. Do we have any options? Sorry. Um, Ryan, then Anna, again. Okay. Libby, I'm curious if we might have some staffing options to be able to remedy this. Um, we don't. Maybe to echo. But we have one bus circulating, picking up middle school and high school students. Is there any opportunity they could pick up the elementary school students as well and deposit that, them at the village school early? That currently is scheduled to pick up the middle school and high school students at Roxbury Village School, not door to door service because door -door of service. the because of the health check. Okay. I was going to ask um, the <clears throat> excuse me the bus company provides that driver. Is that how it works? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, two questions. So the what is the expense that we're saving if we decide not to run the bus for the you said for the driver and for the gas? And then my second question is if the if the bus company can't provide a driver, are they in breach of their contract? Would we be released from the fifty seven thousand dollars if they can't provide oh, I don't know. I don't know the second answer to that. And I actually don't know the first. I asked Grant to get me the numbers for that for, for your first question, Emma, because I anticipated it. Um, and he, I'm realizing right now that he didn't get back to me on that. So I don't know exactly what that savings is, um, but it'd be significant considering the surplus that we had for fourth quarter with busing. So I think it's pretty significant in there. Um, and I don't know about the breach of contract piece because of where we are right now with our current reality with COVID. they may be in a position to say, I know that we were in the position to say in, in other circumstances that have nothing to do with the bus in the spring that because of the circumstances with COVID, because of the closure, that we couldn't possibly pull off the contract and legally, when there's an impossible situation, then you can be out of a contract, you can get out of a contract, and that might be a similar argument for the bus company here. So they would sell charges for the bus even though they wouldn't be able to provide the driver? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a bad situation. Yeah. Maybe we could, I mean, I would be willing to support the bus if we had some kind of a guarantee, but um, could we maybe table that decision until we find out the answer to those two questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I apologize for not knowing the number that we would save because I, I did reach out about that. Grant just must have forgotten. Uh, it might be, I know we've got one of the family members present now. It might be good to survey the families too and, and see, um, yeah. see what the particular situations are. Yeah, we certainly can. Beth can Beth, you can reach out to the families on the um, who said they needed bus. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. I indicated that I would reach out after the meeting anyway, so it would just yeah. be a follow up. We could always schedule an emergency meeting if we just needed to resolve yeah. the bus issue later. Um, I I would just echo what others have said that I'm reluctant to pull the bus from people that need it. But if there is a community solution in light of uncertainty, that mm -hmm. seems worth exploring. Yeah, right, right now, Stacy has a driver.
for it. She just, she has one driver, the one driver for that, that route. Um, so um, in this era, one driver provides inconsistency. Go ahead, Mara. Sorry, I, I cut you off there. No, that's okay. I just, um, I also am loath to pull the bus from people who are depending on it. And since we do have a driver right now, of course, you know, the question of substitute drivers and how long that'll last and everything is, is another question. But since we have the resource budgeted for and and staffed at the moment, and we are T minus, I don't know, 15 seconds to the beginning of the school year, um, it seems like if we could possibly go with the bus for now, we could at least buy ourselves more time to come up with alternative solutions. I just don't know if it's sort of an all or nothing deal where we either start with it or we don't. So do you have an answer well, on that, Libby? Yeah, no, we could start with it. The other thing to keep in mind is that we weren't able to find, I, I advertised for a bus monitor for that bus because I knew we'd need one um, in May and we've gotten no hits on that. So we don't have a bus monitor for it. Now the new safety guidance says we don't technically have to do the health checks on the bus. Um, our bus company would very much like us to do the health checks before kids get on the bus, which is understandable to protect their employees. Um, however, we don't have a bus monitor to do that. So, um, so the kids would be picked up at Roxbury Village School. They'd be picked up at their doors, but then and they'd be taken to the school, and the health check would be done at the school. Um, and not the Montpelier buses all have a bus monitor on them, so they will be doing the bus check, the health check prior to boarding the bus. So it's just another, it's another consideration. I do think though, right now, while we're thinking about this, um, if we were able to find a more resilient, more flexible uh, community solution, while, while we have the time, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be a crazy year no matter what. And I wonder if, you know, if we find that that type of solution now could pay off dividends later on down the road. Um, just, just a thought. Yeah, are there other thoughts or discussion? So it sounds like we're gonna find out further information. Maybe if you need us ask quickly, we can call an emergency meeting. Otherwise, we'll we'll bring it up with a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so our in-service highlights, I just want to give the board some highlights of what we're doing. Uh, we have a woman named Jennifer Abrams coming tomorrow, actually, um, on how to have hard conversations with each other, which is really exciting. Jen's a good friend of mine. She's out in California. Mara, do you know Jen? Have you heard of her? Heard, heard the name. Yeah, she's great. Um, she tells it like it is. She's a woman after my own heart. Um, so she... She's coming. Um, that was a suggestion by our union leaders, which I thought was a great suggestion. So she's coming. We have Tina Bogren coming again, who is also a friend of mine. She's doing a self-care and building personal resilience for our teachers. And she's also doing a full day of training with the MHS faculty around high impact instructional moves uh, to help them plan that two and a half hour block of time, which is a new thing for our MHS um, teachers. So Tina's coming to help. Tina is a um, international trainer with Marzano Research. If you know Robert Marzano's name, it's pretty big um, in the educational world. So Tina is an international trainer with Robert Marzano and Solution Tree. Um, she knows her stuff about high impact um, instructional moves. So she's going to be great for the MHS staff. The principals and district leaders are all doing modules around virtual learning using the book, uh, the distance learning playbook. That was Ryan's suggestion to the leadership team. Um, so we're all doing different modules across the, the next couple of weeks um, so that if we all go virtual, then we all have a common understanding of what that means and common understanding of common expectations. Uh, we're working with um, colleagues at UVM around high quality collaboration because we have our teachers at K-8 especially, collaborating in ways that they've never done before. Each of our classrooms will obviously be a co-teaching or team teaching situation now. So um, we have a lot of time built in for how to, how to do that kind of type of collaboration really well. 
we have about three days planned for parent conferences and IEP meetings that will go, those dates will go out tomorrow to parents from my communication and then teachers and principals will be in, in contact with parents as well as how to how to sign up for parent conferences and IEP meetings. And of course, that is just to hear IEP meetings, it's to design an IEP for the situation we're in now. Um, and the parent conferences is to hear how, how a kid's life has been over the last few months and how they handled the closure what they're nervous, what they're looking forward to in whichever situation in person or virtual that they have coming forward. So that is coming up. We have tons of protocol trainings led by our nurses and our principals and our system principals. And we have a lot of time for reflection and team collaboration built into our in-service for our educators. Um, so overall, our, our union leadership, um, we're quite pleased with our in-service schedule. So I'm, I'm thinking it's gonna be pretty good. We had a lot of teachers in the buildings today moving furniture and, and getting their classrooms set and ready to go. Um, so we're really encouraging our educators to get into the building who are there in person. Um, and a lot of them were today. Uh, any questions on our in-service schedule? Okay. Uh, I sent out last Thursday, we do have new guidance and safety regulations or they're revised. Um, there, the major shifts that we uncovered was that for K-5, they now have, they're now allowing three to six feet between kids. Now we could do it at six feet. So we are remaining, we're holding tight to the six feet rule. Um, we may push those a little bit to like five and a half feet at, in fifth grade rooms, <laughs> right Katie? <laughs> um, to make sure that kids have extra space um, and can see the whiteboard. Uh, but we're we're holding tight to that in our district. We can do it, so we're gonna we're gonna remain there. Um, the again, the bus health checks don't have to be done on the bus or before the bus. However, we're gonna hold tight to that until the weather makes it really hard to do that, um, and then we might switch gears after that. But we're still pretty much sticking to our plans. Other than that, the new health and safety guidance added a whole lot of words with not a lot of substance. Um, and principals, you can correct me if I've forgotten anything there, but there, it was just a lot of words. Uh, but I did link that into my communication last week to families. Fall sports are a go. Um, they will look very different. They can't compete against other schools until the state decides we're in stage three. So the entire state will be in the same stage um, and the, the Secretary of Education and Department of Health will be making that decision of whether we're in stage one, two, or three. Just a reminder, stage one is completely closed, completely virtual. Stage two is what we're opening in, and stage three is all those shells turn to shoulds. They're kind of good reminders. It's kind of just the difference between it. And really, the administrators, we've talked about it, and our plan doesn't really change whether we're in stage two or stage three, which is part of the beauty of our plan. Um, of course, it would change drastically if we we're in stage one. Uh, let's see. Everyone around our athletes will need to be in masks, um, except for cross-country runners. They're the only ones who got a, a lift on that. There's still, even though athletics are a go, there's still no access to our buildings after the school day. So athletes won't have access to the locker rooms. Um, spectators won't have access to our bathrooms. The buildings will be locked down. Um, and nobody will be in them really, uh, unless, I, unless one of us is working. Uh, meeting one of our administrators are working at seven o'clock when the last custodian leaves the building. Um, so even though fall, fall sports are a go, that type of normality, it's not gonna be like it ha always has been. We're limited to 150 spectators. Um, we're talking about, do we give out tickets for certain events, especially when we're playing against places like U32, which tend to get a big crowd. Um, we're talking about where we move our, our athletes, uh, but Matt Link, Andrew LaRosa, uh, and I are having lots of conversations around what athletics will look like in the fall, um, and Matt's still getting guidance on that. So that's pretty much the update. Our principals are working hard right now with in-service and getting their, their uh, teachers accustomed and comfortable um, and giving them a whole lot of time to collaborate and reflect. Uh, but I know that they're all here, with the exception of Renee, she had an emergency vet appointment for her dog. Uh, so the, the, I'm sure they're happy to take questions from the board if they if you have any. Or I am too. Uh, questions or comments, anyone? Bridget. 
Um, Libby, could you talk a little bit about the, the numbers split between in-person and remote in each of the four buildings? Yep. Let me pull it up for you, Bridge. Mike, do you have those up right in front of you? Oh, I got it. Never mind. So these may be slightly off because there's been some changes um, across the day, but in kindergarten, we have 20 students, 21 students. Uh, first grade, we have 11, second, 14, third, 19, fourth, 12, fifth grade, we have 11 students, sixth grade, 14, seventh grade, 23, eighth grade, 17, ninth grade, 21, 10th grade, 22, 11th grade, 16, and 12th grade, 10. Those are the virtual academy numbers? Those are the, yeah. The, the remote, remote learning, yeah. Yeah, number of students who chose fully virtual. They may be off by uh, one or two because people have waffled a little bit. Is it Thanks. still like an 80-20 split? About that. It might be a little less than that now. Like, I mean, 19%. I mean, it's like 18, 19%. It might be a little bit less. But for the most part, it is, it is yeah, the 80-20% the split. Others? We do have, for the board's knowledge, we do have five teachers who are teaching with VTVLC, three at the high school and two at the middle school. Um, and that significantly impacts course placement um, and some specials and things like that at the, at the middle school. Uh, so we have had to cancel some classes at the high school simply because of staffing. Um, but we're, we think we can still do it and kids will be able to take all the required courses and we're not jeopardizing anything for juniors and seniors who we've prioritized in, in class placements and things like that. Have we seen with so many remote options right now, more of our juniors and seniors doing, uh, is it dual enrollment? I think is the act called the early college admission have we seen an increase in our juniors and seniors taking advantage of that this year? Not that I know of, Ryan, but I can I can find out specifically. I haven't talked to Matt McLean about that specifically yet, um, but I can find out for you. I mean, it just seems like if you're going to be doing it remote, you might as well do it remote and get college credit if you could. Yeah. Yeah, we had a limited number of juniors and seniors who chose that option, which is understandable. If I were a senior, I'd be saying, no, I want to go in person <laughs> unless, I, unless I medically couldn't. Um, so, so we have less less kids doing that. Uh, we do have we might have to buy some seats for some kids at VTLC for specific classes, um, but we're still working that piece out. The schedule is a bear. Are you still hiring teachers? Yeah. <laughs> yep, we're hiring. Um, well, we're trying to find that 0.5 special educator. Uh, Ryan sent me over a teacher today that got into your packet a pre K one year position to, to um, cover an unpaid leave for the year. Um, we have, uh, let's see, we have one social studies teacher who told us today that she's taking the retirement buyout. So we'll be posting for a social studies teacher. We have a um, world language teacher at MSMS who's retiring. And so we'll be posting for a world language teacher. We have a guidance counselor at the high school who's potentially retiring. So we'll be posting for that guidance counselor position. We think we can hire the social studies position pretty easily. The guidance and the world language agreed to stay on until we can find a replacement for them. Uh, and so we have a plan. We have plan B in place for those two positions. Um, but I know Renee is, is working on um, a guidance counselor soon, actually, who's worked with us before. So hopefully that works out. Um, but because of the early retirement offer, which we expected, we have some teachers and the pre-K teacher, of course, at RBS that we already spoke of. Um, we knew those teachers would be taking those. Um, and actually, we have less than what we thought. Um, some teachers who we thought were going to stay, we thought we'd have a special educator at UES who decided to stay. We thought we had another MHS teacher who might take the offer, and she decided to stay. So we have a few more people who decided to stick, stick around. We've made other accommodations for them. Thanks. Others? Great. Well, 
Thank you, Libby. Um, again, uh, we appreciate all the the great and long and hard work you're putting into this. Um, uh, this the team is also, putting into this. Yes, you're. I, I meant the collective you. Yes, <laughs> the royal you, right? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, no, all, all of you are doing a, a fantastic job. Um, uh, the RS or RVS, sorry, uh, district wide visioning um, is next. I'm muted. Um, so Ryan, Jerry, Beth, and I had a conversation about this, and I'll let Ryan and Jerry talk. I don't mean to put you guys on the spot, but we had a conversation about this last week, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. It's all it's all rolling together at this moment. But um, Ryan and Jerry, Jerry, do you want to talk about that conversation? Ryan, go ahead. My memory's a little fuzzy right now. I'm not sure I think I can give a, a kind of a general overview. Um, Jerry and I had reached out to Libby and Beth, essentially just inquiring with the consultant project potentially on hold, maybe indefinitely. We just wanted to reach out and see if there was anything we should possibly be doing in town to advocate, reach out, solicit feedback, et cetera, um, until we did make a decision formally about whether or not we are going to be moving forward on the consultant project for our district-wide visioning process. Um, Again, the board hasn't made any commitment one way or the other right now on that project, so it was kind of up in the air. But I think what we did decide on was it would make sense and we're going to do our best to garner a lot of public input throughout this next budget cycle um, to be really involved in the entire visioning process of the budget and how it might relate to Roxbury and try to get more feedback on the village school and uh, more public involvement in our budget cycle this coming budget season. So I think that's a pretty quick synopsis of what had been discussed and I don't know if there's questions or thoughts, but. Um. Yeah, thanks. Um, anything to add, Jerry or Libby or the much it? No, I think that was very nicely stated, Ryan. Good. Thanks, Ryan. So Ryan and I will do some work on our end. Thank you both. Sure. Um, policy reading, my understanding is, Ryan, is that um, you're still noodling on it in the policy committee, so we'll push that to the second. Yes, I mean, we were bombarded with emails this week, everybody asking where the gender draft policy was to review it wasn't in the packet. No, um, we did. We have shifted our policy committee meeting schedule, so it is off. So it's staggered now at the board meeting. So we will be able to get things to the board when need be. But ultimately, we did another read through this week and still felt like we kind of had some unresolved questions regarding some of the language. Um, so we do not have an updated draft yet for the board to read. Um, it'll be really, really, really good when it does get to you. <laughs> I was going to say it's going to be slamming when you get it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we have the leader in the state, Mara Iverson. I mean, if that's not going to be the best policy ever, I don't know what it is. What I can tell you is that as, as a person who works professionally on these sorts of things, I fully intend to use our finished policy as the model policy that I suggest to all of the other school districts around the state. So you can, you know, rest assured that we're going to look really good. <laughs> I was wondering where that policy was. I like took like 10 minutes searching for it because I wanted to read it before the meeting. Sorry. Um, great. And then I think we just have the policy monitoring um, uh, reports. Any, any discussion there? And I don't know why I always forget. We, we have to approve those, right? 
Yeah, I remember yes. last. Remember last at the end of last year, we pulled them out so we so you all could approve them or ask questions around them if you needed to. Yeah, I, I do remember. I need to like tack a sign to my forehead or something. <laughs> uh, That's what you had me for your forehead, Jim. And Bridget was ready to jump in on that too. <laughs> um. So, if no discussion, um, do I have a motion to approve the policy monitoring reports? So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Um, Anakin. Aye. Mara? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Jill? Aye. Emma? Aye. I think that's everyone. Um, so approved. Uh, and then uh, we have given some time back to uh, our administrators, uh, particularly Libby. Uh, it looks like the motion to adjourn is next. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Um, motion to adjourn. Was, 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 was that a movement to adjourn, or we just say motion to adjourn, Andrew? <laughs> I second it. <laughs> if that was a movement. I think we're good. <laughs> we're close enough. Um, Anakin. Aye. Mara. Yes. All the yes. Ryan. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Jill. Aye. Emma. Aye. Thanks all. Um, have a good uh, rest of your night and we'll uh, see each other virtually in September. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good question for me. What is the name of the person who does the tech again? I'm still struggling with my email. Uh, you can send that to Lucas Johnson. Okay, that's it. Let me get Lucas's email for you. Uh, it's just lucasj at mpsvt.org. Tell, okay. tell him I sent you. Is that with a C or a K? C. Okay, great. Thank you, Libby. Nope, no problem. Did you see Anna my, my uh, text to you? about the data piece um no, 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 on the on the chat stacy emerson needs um needs the addresses for the bus routes that i asked for about two weeks ago and it hasn't been given her to her yet so do you have access to that um, in power school i mean i could look in power school to download, all she needs is the student's name, the school, and the address. Um, I haven't pulled anything like that previously, but I can uh, look into it first thing in the morning. Yeah, will you do that for me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. See you tomorrow. Thanks.